Right, good morning, everybody. I think we'll get going. It's 11 o'clock. So um, this week, our guest is uh, going to be talking about Vietnam Enterprise, um, which I think we've been training. I think it's going to be quite an interesting story because um, you've got an economy that seems to be doing quite well, but a market that's gone in the other direction at the end of last year. Um, bits of news that I wanted to cover first. Really, I'm uh, just sticking to infrastructure for the moment. There's, it's still very quiet. It's kind of weird that markets, that there's not a lot going on. But um, we have seen an update for Digital 9 infrastructure. I thought that would be worth having a look at. And we've finally seen um, potential new IPO. So 8085 has, has actually launched its prospectus, having done its attention to float last November. And so we'll see whether that's going to get away or not. So starting with Digital 9 infrastructure first, and here's the sort of infrastructure sector. Um, these things are a reasonable size, but they are now trading on quite big discounts. Um, and Digital 9 offers really quite an attractive yield. So you think that that seems a bit strange. Um, in terms of returns, it's still a bit sort of early in the days, really. So um, six and a half percent return, NEV return for last year. Obviously, it's still been investing its money, and there's a sort of cash drag as we go. As we go further on, they, they are targeting returns much higher than that. Um, be interesting to see if they actually manage to achieve those, because if they do, it definitely looks cheap. There is the NEV, um, and the share price obviously fell away from um, September onwards, and it's now a, a chunkyish discount. Um, it got into the main market on 6th of December, with 6th of September. So it's now actually eligible to be included in the FTSE indices. So it's going to the FTSE to 50 index. That maybe helps a bit. Uh, I'm never quite sure whether it does or not. And you get some index by me, you also get lots of shorting activity and stuff as well. Um, but the reason that the um, discount first opened up, I think, is because in the interim results that they published on the 14th of September, they do attention to the fact that hikes in interest rates in the US in particular meant that they did have to increase the discount rate used to value the portfolio. Now, these discount rates for these digital infrastructure funds are a lot higher than the discount rates for uh, things like HICL or international um, public partnerships. It's almost double probably, and a lot higher than they are in the human energy sector as well. So 13.7%. Um, wage service discount rate is, is really quite chunky. And that means that there is some flex there between the risk-free rate, so the, the rate on equivalent government bonds, and the, the discount rate. So the, the risk premium, which is the, the gap between the two, could has got scope to narrow. And that, that part of that is all around um, how much um, construction activity is going on. So as they're building the portfolio out. So as, as things move from construction phase to operational, that should reduce the discount rate. So that there are things here that could build in NEV rises in the future, but we'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, so that unnerved people a bit. Then on the 23rd of September, obviously, we had the mini budget and um, UK borrowing rates went mental, um, and that upset everything. It did recover a bit from there, but then we lost its management team, which is a <laughs> recurring theme in the sector. Um, and it... I understand why that unknows investors. Um, there is, I did say at the time, we did talk about this in the, the show at the time, that you know that obviously that's that's going to be um, upsetting because the guys taken over doesn't have any digital experience necessarily. But um, each of the underlying companies that we're going to talk about, they do have their own management teams in place. And so um, there isn't, I don't think it makes a huge impact on the fund, but we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. This is how it looks at the end of September. Um, so it's between data centers, subsidy cables and wireless. They want to have some more sort of terrestrial uh, digital in there as well. Um, and that's gonna come, I think, with uh, one of the investments. Um, they had quite a lot of money deployed. A lot of that was inflation linked income on long-term revenue, uh, recurring revenues. So um, 7.3 weighted average contract term. Uh, some of that inflation protection is capped, so you don't cap to all of that. <coughs> some of it is kind of lagged, but nevertheless, that, that, that should be encouraging, I think. Um, this timeline I've shown you before, we won't go into this, except I just wanted to highlight that it did raise quite a lot of money. So we've got the initial IPO, we've got the top up pricing, and another one there, another one in January. Then they do the 
uh, revolving credit facility, so you can actually borrow money and, and do it that way. Then the one that happened in July, although it was 60 million, that was probably a lot less than they were hoping for. So this was the, the, the first signs that the wheels were coming off a bit from the sector. So um, they have put all of that to, to work more or less. Um, most of it is committed. And that's part of the, the issue that we own to here. So it is chucking off quite um, a lot of uh, profit in terms of EBITDA there. It's less in terms of cash flow, but that's still still positive um, and enough to cover the dividend and enough to, to run the, the RCF down as they, um, as they go. Um, so that will provide some funding to fund its ex expenditure pipeline. So this 264 million is what they've committed, uh, well, what the underlying companies have, have committed to spend in 2023. Now, that doesn't all have to come from digital nine infrastructure, as we'll explain um, later on. Um, but it would have been nice if they could have done it, which is why they wanted to carry on raising more money. And they would have ideally like to, to fund this and do uh, more investments as well to keep diversifying the portfolio. There's, there's more behind that. Um, but the only amount they actually had committed to spend at the end of December was £46 million, And they had... Um, cash to, to come to cover that. So they've got so cash in the bank, said four million, room on the existing uh, revolving credit facility, and the chance to, to stretch that by another 125 million. But they don't really probably want to do that unless they were doing it with certain knowledge that they're going to raise equity finance on the back of it. It's not that expensive. Uh, so that borrowing cost actually come down a bit. So three and a half percent over LIBOR. Um, I think that's all quite manageable, and the returns are quite. Good one minute once I get these things going. Right, so let's have a quick look at some portfolio. So um, the big one is Vern Global, which is data centers based in Ireland. So using geothermal energy, all good stuff because obviously um, these data centers consume an awful lot of power and they generate a lot of heat. So um, if you can put them in an area that's cold and you can get uh, renewable energy to fund them, to power them, then um, that's great in terms of what the customers want. So that basically, as fast as it expands, it's picking up customers and that seems to be the sort of dual in the portfolio. They've got a data center in London that they've uh, merged into the kind of Vern um, umbrella. Um, we'll talk about that next. So um, it's actually loss making at the moment because it's got a, a lag in, in the way that it hands on the power price hikes. Um, so that should be uh, reversed in this current period now. Um, we have to wait and see whether that's true or not. Um, they're also actively trying to shift customers from London, where there's obviously capacity constraints, into um, Iceland only where it doesn't really matter in terms of the transmission time but I was forward to the data center to the customer. Um, so that's quite good business for them if they can do that. Um, and again, there's sort of expansion plans there to, to grow that. Then in Finland, well, hang on, I've gone too far. Uh, in Finland, yeah, they, they've got further capacity expansion to go there. And it's a similar sort of story in terms of like, I think it's hydroelectric powering it, which is obviously helpful. Um, Aquacoms is their subsea fiber business, um, which goes back and forth across the Atlantic and other places too. Um, it had a cable fall, which meant that it, which had pinned impact on its revenue um, in the interim period. That should be fixed now, I think. And they're also trying to build another cable alongside it, so they'll have some redundancy in there. Um, so again, so we've got two things now where they were supposed to be making money and they weren't, but still they were generating decent sorts of revenues overall. So I think that gives you some comfort. Um, there's no gearing in any of these. So all of these things, the th three verns, aquacoms, there is room to, to put gearing into the structure to um, fund the capacity expansion. Um, EMIC is a new subsea cable uh, running all the way to India. That's under construction. So this is one of the big things that um, once it's up and running, there should be room to, to write that up in value and so provide some NEV growth. Arkiva, um, 
does all of the kind of uh, TV and radio infrastructure in the UK. So, and it's just a monopoly on this, more or less. Um, and it's the one that's got existing debt finance, and they reckon it can fund its capex requirements by itself. So they don't need to come back to digital nine. Um, again, it is not sort of running on all cylinders because it put in place inflation link swaps, which um, are offsetting the inflation link price increases that it's got. And so, and they run until 2027. Not much we can do about that, but I think it seems to be okay. Um, and to answer Tim's question, for the most part, um, Digital 9 owns 100% of these. I think there's one of those where it has a minority stake, and I can't remember which one, but um, if I put that out while we're talking, I'll come back to you. Uh, cool. Um, and then we've got uh, a new venture, Giggle, which is running fiber to the home in Glasgow, um, and then a wireless broadband, broadband business in Dublin, Host Island. So those are the sort of spread of things that it's got there. So Giggle would be the terrestrial fibre thing they'll that, that, that's going to build out. So they're conscious, obviously, they've got capital constraints. They're considering whether they can set off minority stakes in these businesses um, to somebody else um, or just put the finance debt financing in at the investing company level. Um, I think all of that might be doable, but... It's just a constraint on this business, um, which it doesn't really need. I think it really should be back trading asset value and raising equity. Um, but that requires a sort of sea change in, in um, people's attitudes to it. Now, 8085 comes along and it, it wants to invest in digital infrastructure too. Um, and so, I mean, that, that and the fact that the Pantheon infrastructure is doing it, it does seem to be quite a good business. Pantheon have told me the other day that they still see um, room for considerable growth within this market with it, without sort of an sort of overbuilt situation sometime. And some of these things are kind of natural monopolies anyway. So I'm um, sure some Pantheon's doing National Broadband Island, which um, is going to rural parts of Ireland and, and there just won't have any competition because nobody wants to do that. Um, but that's run on more of a sort of PPP type um, basis. Anyway, so 8085 is looking um, to invest in sort of the, the mid market of infrastructure where it reckons the returns are better. Um, and it's a fund that, that tried to launch before. So it tried to launch as a digital capital infrastructure, um, but the manager since changed its name and it to Astatine, and that's where the 85 comes from, it's the atomic number for Astatine. Um, so it's looking for 300 million. It will settle for 100 if it has to. Um, the offer's open to private investors as well as professional investors. It runs for most of February um, and then this is in March. Obviously, there's a room to stretch that if they, they need to. As usual, issue expenses are capped about 2%. Um, and then the ongoing expenses, I think, are reasonable, so about 1.3% overall. And there's, importantly, there's no performance fee here. And there's no double counting of fees on when it invests into Astatine vehicles. Um, and then it, it's a tiered management fee, but it's not going to sort of trouble that in terms of the, the first fundraise. Um, it's got a portfolio to buy straight away, um, which is a chunk of one of the manager's funds, the Mind Infrastructure Fund 4, which is still making investments. And then three things that are in that fund that it was going to make direct co investments into. So ACL Airshop is sort of these um, uh, vehicles that go around airports and they're moving pallets and stuff around. And uh, so it's the, those vehicles, BTR waste vehicles are sort of like um, uh, sort of rubbish trucks. Um, I think they're leased to people like Viola, but I can't remember that's definitely true. Um, and Everfast Fiber is a carve out of a fiber business in Kansas City. Um, all sort of you know, reasonably interesting stuff. They obviously think that they're not going to offer decent returns. And it's got a further pipeline behind that, well over half a billion. So it's got stuff to do. Um, they're not putting a lot of borrowing in at the company level because there will be some underlying debt at the asset level, um, which obviously is, isn't really in DGI 9 at the moment, but, but except for that um, one investment. 
So there is room that is normal to do this. Their char targeting returns of 8 to 10% um, after fees and everything else. Um, and the dividends aren't too bad. So 4.5% in first year, rose to 5 in second year. But like Pantheon Infrastructure, the, the target is to try and grow the NEV as much as delivering income. So these, these two funds are more like 3i infrastructure than they are Hickle, uh, if you can do what I mean. Um, they can grow the fund up to a billion uh, with the permissions they've got um, at launch to control the premium. Um, but they have interestingly committed to buy back if the discount is more than 5%, which I think is encouraging. And there is a sort of um, trigger uh, for a possible wind up if it doesn't get beyond 300 million within the first three years. Um, and assuming it gets through that, there's a five yearly continuation rate. So I think that's all reasonable, really, in terms of some sort of investor protections. Um, so we'll see, I think, really, whether it happens or not. It'd be nice to see one IPO go away. Um, but um, we will see. Um, question is, ATI 5 looks more of a mature business compared to DGI 9. I think, to some extent, that's true. Um, they, they've been making investments for, for some years. Um, they've got a track record in the prospectus, obviously, you know, if you're interested to go away and read the prospectus before you make any time decision. They've got a track record that goes back to 2014 um, that they've put in there, but they have been making investments since 2005. So, yeah, I think there's, there's, there is that sort of angle to it. But, um, but remembering that DGI9 is, is, is invested in some businesses that have been around for a while too. And it say it's not running those businesses itself. It's got underlying management teams doing that. So, there we go. That's enough from me.